The increased consumption of red meat is often associated with cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and certain forms of cancer. But is this the whole story? I'm going to share with you a clip from Dr. Stevan Van Vliet, a researcher with expertise in this area, to share some of the nuances to consider. Yeah, no, there's definitely a, a now a large concern about both the environmental and human health effects of red meat. And uh, yeah, a lot of this, at least from the human health perspective, is based on epidemiological data where we associate uh, single foods, in this case red meat, with, with deleterious outcomes such as heart disease or, 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 or diabetes, obesity, you, uh, you name it, and uh, it has been associated with it. An important part is there is that I think diet quality is an important portion there because if you, if you can see in some, in some of these studies like uh, the healthy shopper studies or uh, the Oxford Epic cohort or the Albertus Tomorrow project, what you can see is that once diet quality increases, you see that these associations between red meat and human health largely become neutral. Mm -hmm. So there is obviously this concern with uh, people that tend to eat more red meat, also tend to exercise less, tend to eat less fruits and vegetables, tend to maybe uh, be of uh, general less health, healthy lifestyle factors. So, so those are definitely important nuances to recognize. And Up until recently, research has always lumped together processed red meat, the burgers and hot dogs you'd find at your local fast food chain, with unprocessed red meat, like the steak you might buy at your butcher shop. What happens when the researchers separate those two things? A recent meta-analysis of 20 studies and over 1.2 million people recently found that unprocessed red meat was not associated with heart disease and type 2 diabetes. On the other hand, singling out the processed red meat revealed a 42% greater risk of heart disease and a 19% greater risk of type 2 diabetes. In 2019, a systematic review of randomized trials comparing low to high intake of red meat found low to very low certainty evidence that higher intakes of red meat had any effect on cardiometabolic health or cancer mortality or incidence of cancer. Yet another study which hypothesized that consuming more than 3.5 servings of red meat per week would negatively impact your blood lipids, so your cholesterol levels, and your blood pressure actually found that consuming greater than 3.5 servings per week had no clinical impacts on modifiable risk factors for heart disease. All right, so where does this leave us? Let's circle back to two important points that Stefan makes at the end of that last clip. The first, most people that eat processed red meat are eating it at fast food restaurants, along with the fries, the soda, the dessert, and all of the excess calories. This drives weight gain, high blood sugar levels, inflammation, high blood pressure, and is the precursor to all the chronic conditions, which I'll come to in a minute. The second is an important point if you're a carnivore diet follower because the diet quality matters. Fruits, vegetables, leafy greens, the polyphenols, type of antioxidant, found in these types of foods are really important for our health. And so I'm going to circle back to this at the very end of this clip on why you should consider adding more of those in. Two key features of why a carnivore diet works well for people who are struggling with their health is that one, it dramatically reduces energy intake, aka calories. If you cut out processed food, junk food, all the high calorie stuff, you would have a huge reduction in energy intake and that is a powerful signal, the most powerful signal for improving blood sugars, blood pressure, inflammation, and the like. Number two, protein intake. People who follow a carnivore diet unquestionably are going to increase their protein intake because that's the main focus of the diet. Now you might be thinking, well, it's not just about weight loss. Well, when it comes to chronic conditions like type 2 diabetes, we can make a really strong argument that actually it's all about weight loss. In this next clip, you'll hear from diabetes expert, Dr. Nicola Guess, all about the magnitude of effect that weight loss has on preventing and reversing type 2 diabetes. Sure. Um, so type 2 diabetes is diagnosed when your fasting blood glucose goes above seven um, or there is something where your two hour glucose after a glucose tolerance test is 11.1. So your glucose has got to be pretty high to meet the definition of type 2. Prior to developing type 2, um, there is a condition called prediabetes, which is basically where your blood glucose is high, but not high enough to meet the threshold for type 2 diabetes. Now, what's quite interesting is prediabetes actually is an umbrella term for at least two conditions. So, for example, you could have elevated fasting glucose, 
And that might be between 6.1 and 6.9. So remember, type 2 diabetes is 7. You can have a fasting blood glucose of uh, 6.1 to 6.9, but your two-hour glucose is perfectly normal. So in other mm -hmm. words, all of your management of glucose is perfectly normal when you're fasting. Sorry, it's elevated when you're fasting, but it's perfectly fine when you eat. Now, on the other hand, some people have perfectly normal fasting glucose, but it all goes um, hyperglycemic after they eat. So they can manage glucose in the fasting state, but glucose starts getting elevated after they eat. So pre-diabetes sort of develops like that. You might have either elevated fasting or elevated two hours. Um, and what's quite interesting for me is it's become apparent those are two different conditions. That's really interesting, yes, because it's definitely something that um, folks tend to just lump prediabetes into one umbrella versus having these two separate conditions. So, um, Nicola, the current guidelines for the prevention of type 2 diabetes in people at high risk are, are based around achieving that weight loss, you know, moderate weight loss, 3 to 7%, um, via dietary changes and increasing physical activity. So, can you outline what the recommended dietary guidelines are at the moment? Yes. I mean, so this has come from... Um, a series of large clinical trials. So really well executed clinical trials done in China, Finland, um, the United States, um, Sweden, Japan, all over and India. And what they have shown conclusively is that, like you said, moderate weight loss, five to seven percent. So that might be four to six kilos helps to at least delay or prevent type two diabetes. Now, there is only one dietary pattern that has been tested in all of those trials. And that is basically your typical high carbohydrate, high fiber, low fat, low saturated fat diet. Um, and so that's been one of the frustrations for me. And it's an active area of my research that I think we could be offering patients more variety. Um, and let me just reiterate, it's, it's likely that 90% of the effect on prevention is due to weight loss. So weight loss is a key feature of preventing and reversing type 2 diabetes, as well as things like hypertension and cardiovascular disease. Now, a nice part about a carnivore diet or a high protein diet is the benefits you get when you increase animal protein consumption because of the level of micronutrition. In this next clip, you'll hear a little deep dive from Dr. Stefan Van Fleet all about the added benefits. Uh, from animal foods, we do get a plethora of, uh, of nutrients that are not just beyond zinc, vitamin B, iron, but also some of these, uh, yeah, these extended compounds, some of some, some more uh, complex herpenoids like squalene or cysteamine. Cysteamine is, for instance, an important precursor to glutathione, which is a main antioxidant go, in yeah, the body. Antioxidant. Yeah, and we know about taurine, for instance, and anserine, which are very important for cognitive function and, and play a, a central role in, in many uh, cellular processes. And these are exclusively found in, in animal source foods, and, and especially for, for young children and, and for cognitive development, that uh, those things can be important. So while arguably, yes, we can reduce our, our red meat consumption in Western civilization, there is a need also for to uh, to, to make sure that this is yeah, stays balanced and obviously also has to be looked at in the in the context of overall uh, dietary patterns. Mm -hmm. All right, let's bring things full circle. At the start of this video, Stefan talked about how a low intake of fruits and vegetables is not ideal to support overall health. And in fact, when you increase your animal protein intake, you should consider adding more, not less. Have a listen to this next clip. Through that, and also supported by randomized controlled trials that when consumed as part of a wholesome diet, but then see also rich in fruits and vegetables, some of these associations may disappear. And, and we know this from mechanistic data too. The combination of, and I think the French were up to something when they drank a glass of uh, red wine with their with their, with their their meat, right? Like yeah, yeah. including some of these polyphenols and including the herbs and, and other plant foods, fruits and vegetables, and eating them in combination with meat also can make some of these, these mutagenic compounds or these, they can render them mostly in, ineffective and, and reduce their, their issues. So I'm not, don't want to say that there's no potential issue with uh, with eating red meat, uh, but I do think that diet in which this is consumed is a huge uh, modulating factor. And there's a shift now slowly mm -hmm. towards more dietary patterns where, where 
where uh, also in in, the, in in my field, uh, scientists realize that we, we should study uh, dietary balance. And you also see it with the dietary guidelines for Americans that there's more attention being paid now to dietary patterns where we, where we talk about like either we talk about, you know, Mediterranean diets, Okinawan diets, or, or you name it, traditional mm. Nordic diets. What do all these diets have in common? Despite the fact that they are very much different, what they have in common, the, the diet quality is high. Mm. Uh, so they don't so eat that's, crap. <laughs> like, yeah, they don't eat or they crap. Very yeah. little of it. <laughs> yeah, what we make is very complicated, but in reality, it is it is very simple. Uh, the, the message only is yeah, how do you get people to do that? Obviously, with, yeah, uh, with an abundance of uh, yeah, and and, all, and it, it is hard, and I also don't think it's because of weakness of people. There is just so no. much abundance of, of of processed foods, and with marketing and and messaging. Yeah, you, you just generally see that that you're being bombarded with it. And, and All right, let's sum things up. Processed red meat is strongly associated with chronic diseases like cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and cancers. However, unprocessed red meat is not. But your dietary pattern matters. So consider adding more veggies, fruits, and leafy greens to better support your overall health. Question about the carnivore diet or anything you heard in this episode? Hit me in the comments section below and we'll get you some answers. If you enjoyed this episode, please share with friends and family and hit subscribe at the bottom so you'll know when the next video drops. 